Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second Sunday in Lent. Let us prepare our minds and our hearts to worship our Father in heaven. Let us pray. Thank you, Father God, that we are one of yours, that we are your children, and nothing can change that. Help us not doubt your love, but instead to walk in the power of knowing who we are in you. Thank you for being a God, a good Father to us. You have called us out of the darkness of the ordinary and have brought us into the light of the extraordinary. You have handpicked us, and you love us, and we are so thankful. In your word, Ephesians 1, 5, and 6, because of his love, God has already decided to make us his own children through Jesus Christ. That was what he wanted and what pleased him. And it brings praise to God because of his wonderful grace. God gave that grace to us freely in Christ, the one he loves. 
In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is found on page 297 in your hymnals, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Gracious God, we come giving you thanks and praise. Your justice stands in splendor and majesty. You nourish the faithful with mercy and kindness from your generosity. Lord, you created all things. You give us life, health, and wealth, but we exist for you, Lord. May we always live in you as well as all the things that you've given us to use. You have shown your majesty and mighty acts from the beginning of creation. You maintain a covenant with your chosen people. You raised leaders and prophets among your people and one greater than them all in your son and our teacher, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus taught with words and deeds of authority not the knowledge that puffs up, but the love that builds others up. Your holy words were in his mouth. Even demons were silenced and obeyed his commands. When he was killed, you gave him new life. Through him, we have life and the promise that death has been defeated. In him, the death grip has been broken for eternity 
and the grippling grip of death is ruined forever. So with our hearts lifted high, we present to those, we, we present those to you who are defending their land, those who are hungry, those who are lonely, helpless, hopeless, trampled under the, by others, sick and grieving. Through Jesus our Christ, we always offer you thanks and praise. We praise you and he who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. And now, Lord, we are bold to pray as you've taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and recite with me the affirmation of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Whenever we assemble in this place, we assemble to worship, putting God and the call of God to us to be disciples above all else. So we come and we, we offer our lives, we offer our wallets, we offer our service, because that's what, meaning, or that's what living in the kingdom of God means. Jesus tells us about that, but that's a sermon, I'm not gonna preach that one now. We just need to be aware that when we give, we give not out of our, we give our, out of our abenda, abundance, but not what we have left over. We give what's needed to further the kingdom of God. Let's receive the morning offering. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. Because he's given Jesus Christ his song. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. Take these gifts that we've given you, O Lord. Consecrate them. Make them holy. And in their holiness, may they support others. May others be fed, educated, healed. Because of what we're willing to do in dedication and commitment to you. As thanksgiving and as sacrifice. Accept these gifts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning's responsive reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. Jesus and his followers went into Capernaum. Immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and started teaching. The people were amazed by his teaching. 
for he was teaching them with authority, not like the legal experts. Suddenly there in the synagogue, a person with an evil spirit screamed, what have you to do with this? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One from God. This ends the reading. Each one of us has at least one defining event in our lives. It changed us. It could be a wedding, or maybe a divorce. It could be the birth of a child, or a too early death of a good friend. It might be the day we decided to follow Jesus. These events become landmarks that we remember the rest of our lives. They are big deal events. And in most cases, they're public events, like birthdays that the rights of, uh, celebrate the rites of passage. Like if you're a Latino girl, Sweet 16 is a major, major birthday. Or maybe it's 18 or 21, when our families and friends recognize us as adults. I mean, really adults. And usually that means getting kicked out of the house as well. For me, one of those times was my ordination as an elder in the United Methodist Church, along with the exchange of marriage vows between Fran and I, and Fran's affirmation to tolerate and support me for the rest of my life. I can still picture Bishop James Mace Alt placing his hands on my head and saying, take thou authority to preach the word, administer the sacraments, and administer the order of the church. The church had recognized and affirmed my call to ministry. Now I just want you to take a few seconds to remember one of those life-changing events in your life. One of those experiences. I'll bet you didn't have to think too long, did you? They usually pop right up. Maybe more than one. Now let's look at the world and the world-changing event, the most significant one in history. It happened in Capernaum in the region of Galilee on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, or we also know it depending on the map you're using as the Lake Gennesaret. Jesus, when he entered Capernaum, which was a major city, a major stop on the east-west highway, the way of the sea it was called, major highway in the Roman Empire. Jesus went there, and when he went there, he entered the local synagogue, and he began to preach. And the people noticed something immediately. Jesus was different. Other teachers of the law quoted outside authorities and references, but Jesus' teaching was different. He taught with genuine power, like he got it from God. He caught their attention. 
They hadn't experienced that kind of authority in their lives. Other rabbis quoted and mimicked other interpreters of the law, but not Jesus. No. He had a certain way about him that was confident. From this morning's text, we can guess that he taught with a first person rather than a third person perspective. It was like he knew and understood something that teachers and legal experts did not. Acting and speaking that way stirs things up, and it would for him as well. In the course of his teaching, a man interrupted him. It turns out that the fellow who confronted him was possessed by a demon, a demonic spirit. And it was really the spirit that was talking. He doesn't like Jesus being there. That's true always of evil. It never likes grace. It never likes love. It never likes Christ. But when the spirit speaks, he says, hey, I know who you are. And in Jesus' day, if you knew someone's name, you could control them. It was a threat. The spirit thinks he has power over Jesus, but verse 25 tells us much different. We didn't happen to read that verse, but let me read it to you now. Remember, or at least share it with you now. It says, Jesus was teaching them with authority. We got that. That authority extended beyond his preaching. According to John Wesley, Authority refers to Jesus' role as God's designated representative. He is the authentic interpreter of scripture. This authority is confirmed through the exorcism of demons. The unclean spirit recognizes that Jesus is God's holy one who destroys the demonic. The spirit was threatened and the people were astounded. Now Jesus wasn't gentle when he addressed the spirit. He commands him to leave the man, come out of him. The spirit came out. But not without shaking the man and screaming and let everybody know that the spirit wasn't happy about it. What the crowd experienced that day was unbelievable and they were shaken themselves. They started to talk with their friends about Jesus. First, he teaches like no one they have ever heard. And then he cast out a demon. And right after that, Jesus goes on to Simon's house where he's staying and heals Simon's mother-in-law. See, this day provides Jesus a defining day. It's just as significant as the events in our lives that define us. Somebody compared it to uh, the southern ritual of deputants. They get presented. Jesus is out of the public now. And for a faith community to experience this man's life changing is also unbelievable. Can you imagine? Now, there were other healers running around the countryside. And unlike some purported others, he might have grown up. We might have, I'm sorry, let me try this sentence again. And unlike some purported other preachers, we might have grown up with, Jesus is the real deal. He's genuine, and it shows. For me, it's also interesting that the first miracle Jesus performs for Mark is an exorcism. In healing this man, Jesus demonstrated that he had the authority that the people recognized. That authority goes beyond teaching. He even has authority over the forces of evil. Now, from a 20th century perspective, it's difficult for us to react as that first century crowd did. Maybe that's because we, too, have heard of many faith healers 
who happen to be frauds. One TV preacher, Hoxter, from the 1960s, continues to sell Miracle Spring water that he will supply you with for just $19. The spring water, interestingly enough, does not provide healing, which is what I would have guessed it was. No, it provides financial success. Now, of course, after paying another $19 to encourage the miracle of a financial increase and a check for $27 will bring a new endeavor that will bring magnificent rewards in just three months from the day you obey God in this. And the letters requiring more donations to ensure the miracles continue, and so do the letters. Only the amount goes up. Other hucksters will give you a miracle prayer cloth. That relieves joint pain. Now, a few of us this morning would undoubtedly welcome that, but it's a fraud too. All that's to say that many false teachers, even today, ignore the gospel in their quest for money, fame, or both. But Jesus is different. That's why he made such an impression on that crowd that day. Not only did he perform miracles, he understood scripture and interpreted it to provide hope to hungry people. He offered and still does an alternative way of life that brings not depression and despair, but hope and the promise of a more fulfilling life. And sometimes we too get lost in the complexities of life. C.S. Lewis once wrote, we are far too easily satisfied. We, like a child who turns down an invitation for a day at the beach and chooses instead to stay sitting in a slum, in a slum alley, making mud pies just because the child can't imagine how much better a day at the shore would be. What could be better than making these slimy pies? The child might think, ah, if only he knew, Lewis wrote. And if we go to verse 15 of this chapter of Mark, we understand that Jesus came into Galilee after John was arrested to announce good news, God's good news. And what was the good news? He tells us, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Traditionally translated, God's kingdom is here. The kingdom of God has come. Change your hearts and your lives and trust this good news. And what is God's kingdom? And how does it look? Well, simply put, it looks much like what the people of Capernaum and Galilee saw in Jesus that day. Jesus is the example of kingdom living. Living in the kingdom of God means being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to live with kingdom values. And where do we find kingdom values? Jesus tells us. A new commandment I give to you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Deciding to follow Jesus means discipleship, and that's exactly what Jesus is inviting us to. <clears throat> and disciples are transformed into Christ-likeness. In our denomination, G uh, churches are supposed to make disciples who make disciples. Do we struggle with our faith? You bet. The disciples did too. When Jesus called them, they were ready to take on the mantle, but they were not transformed overnight. Jesus actually trained them for three years, and those were tough three years. It reminds me of a child beginning music lessons. They don't master their instruments overnight. As a matter of fact, 
having both a, 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 a trumpeter, a reed instrument. I guess we had two trumpeters. Yeah. Yeah, we heard a lot of bad music. That's another story. But the beginning of anything new is hard. There are mistakes in mastering the techniques and reading the music. And it takes time to learn how to make the instrument sing and interpret the score. So the score lives. That's what Jim would try to teach his students. Make it live, make it sing. And that's why there are mentors like he was and Richard was and music teachers. The master guides the student really as an apprentice or a disciple would be guided to become a master who can instruct and teach others. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do. Become disciples, become little Jesuses, if you will, as Dallas Willard puts it, so that we affect others who, to come into the kingdom and train them to do what Jesus wants us to do. We are mentored by a master, Jesus, and frankly, those who Jesus sends, those who God calls out. But the mission is always to become like Jesus. Now this takes me to a question of Jesus' final words to his disciples. Matthew reports them as, I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. Luke reports a little differently, but still it's the same message. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus is a demonstration or example of what serving God is like. Serving others focuses on their needs. It means using all our power and means to provide it, even when it's difficult. Notice that Jesus tells them that their business is making disciples by the witnesses, witnessing and nurturing they do. Living their faith makes a real difference. Now let me ask you a question. Does your faith drive your decisions? Do you take the words of Jesus seriously enough to want to live them out? Or are you a good person? even attend church once in a while, maybe every Sunday. There's a difference between being a follower of Jesus and just attending. The first, Ash, the Ash Wednesday sermon we heard this year, the speaker, Jim Gennati, said, you gotta do the work. You gotta do the work. Jim, I'll bet you knew every time a student came in and hadn't practiced. Didn't you? Yeah. You can pretty well tell. Now there's nothing wrong with being a good person. Good people treat other people with respect. Good people help others get to become better people. Those are great acts. But they do not necessarily introduce others to Jesus and encourage them to become disciples. Now I hope you know by this time that I'm grateful for your generosity. 
Other people depend on you for food, nourishment, footwear, medical assistance, and shelter. Corporately, our generosity is an excellent outcome of the faith that drives us, but does taking care of temporal needs make a long-term difference in the lives of others? Let that sit for a couple of seconds. Does taking care of their temporal needs make a long-term difference in the lives of others? Well, to a degree, yes. And if they don't introduce, that is, if we don't introduce people to Jesus, we've missed the mark. The purpose of the church is not fulfilled if we don't introduce people to Jesus. That's why Jesus commissioned the disciples. Paul writing to the church at Corinth attempts to help them understand in chapter 13 of that first letter that we can have elegant speech, have various spiritual gifts. We can know all the mysteries of the universe. Even if we sacrifice all our wealth and possessions, it really means nothing if we don't help others get beyond their temporal needs by loving them. I'm nothing and I gain nothing, he says, because I missed the mark. Paul lists agape love, self-giving love, as the answer. But loving another is not some simple emotional practice. It looks out for others, helps them seek their, their best interest, and puts their needs on an equal level with, other, uh, with our own. In Jesus' words, we are to treat others and love others as we want to be treated. Our actions can change the dynamics. Luke 6, verses 37 and 38 tell us, we'll get what we give. Here's a pretty close to a quote. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, packed down firmly, shaken and overflowing, will be put into your lap. The portion you give will determine the portion you receive in return. Now let's be clear. Preachers have in an effort to motivate people to part with their money, often taken that last verse, given it'll be given to you, that last statement they take out of context. We don't give expecting returns. We don't give expecting it to be multiplied. We don't, that's, a, that's an investment. That's not a gift. Getting back should never be our motivation for our giving or our behavior. But as I've shared, I've seen more instances of generous people with their love, attitude and acceptance, forgiveness and giving receive more than they have been given. That's the blessing of God. Toyohiko Kagawawa was born to a philandering businessman and a concubine. While he was young, he was orphaned, and he was sent away to a school where two American missionary teachers took him into their homes. He learned English from his new landlords and became a Protestant Christian convert. He studied at Presbyterian College and Kobe Theological Seminary. And during his studies, he became troubled that so much emphasis was placed on the technicalities of the Christian doctrine. He would point to the parable of the Good Samaritan as the truth beyond, behind Christianity. He became an activist, spent time in Japanese labor camps highlighting corruption, illicit prostitution, 
informal marriages, which was, by the way, just a ruse for prostitution, and accepting money to care for children and then kill the children. He would side with workers during strikes, and of course, that sent him to another prison term. He lived with a deteriorating heart and never gave up his work. He was an example of Christian character even after he was confined to his bed. He said, it seemed that everyone was attacking me, the Soviet communist, the anarchist, the capitalist, the foul-mouthed literary critics, the sensationalist newspaper men, the Buddhist who could not compete with Christ, and those many Christians who profess Christ but believe in a Christianity which is sterile. He was a witness for Christ, attempting to live out his life faithfully and practically. As his health deteriorated, he continued to work even from his bed. And on April 23rd, 1959, he was unconscious for three hours. He, he, he was unconscious for three hours. When he woke, he smiled at his wife and the others around him, and he said, please do your best for world peace and the church in Japan. And then he passed. Even in his deathbed, he never abandoned his call to discipleship. Now, lends a time for us to test and examine our ways. It's a time to grasp and accept the call to be followers of Jesus. We do that through Bible study, but we also do it through corporate prayer and individual prayer. We do it through worship. We do it through fellowshipping with others. We're called to do more than take Jesus' name. We're called to become little Jesuses who invite others to know him and become his apprentices. Are you doing that? Can others see Jesus in you? Can you honestly say that you live the way Jesus wants you to? And if you could say yes to that, then I invite you to go back and read the Gospels one more time and use them as a measure. It's not something that happens once. We grow every day and we grow because we look at ourselves and we examine ourselves. As Christians, we're called to put the needs of others above our own perceived need and do it responsibly. Then when we succeed, others will know who Jesus is because they have seen him in us. Amen. Sinners to the gospel feast. Let every soul be Jesus' guest. Ye need not one be left behind, for God hath Set by my Lord on you I call, the invitation is to all, come all the world, come sinner thou, all things in Christ are Sin oppressed, ye rest.
restless wanders after rest, ye poor and maimed and halt and blind, in Christ a hearty welcome find. My message as from God Come to Christ and live. Oh, let His love your hearts constrain, nor suffer Him to die in vain. This is the time no more delay. This is the Lord's accepted day. Come thou this moment at his call and live for him who died for all. Now may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you be filled with all the fullness of God. The blessings of God, the Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit Bless, preserve, and keep you ever in his care. Amen.